me just explain one more time what TestDOM actually does because we are going to have examples uh, from TestDOM. We are an online uh, technical screening company where we have a lot of different tests for different skills and company buy, companies buy our tests to screen uh, tech talent online by sending prospective candidates uh, a link to a test they solve in their browser. Outline of the talk. Uh, half of the talk is going to uh, uh, analyze uh, the problem. It's very important to understand the problem because common practices used at uh, many companies today are not optimal, to say the least. And then we are going to see what bigger companies with much bigger products and systems recommend doing to streamline uh, a feature uh, 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 discovery, uh, implementation, and uh, how to audit features. And we are going to end up the talk with Q&A. So what is the problem? Well, once you release a product, it never stops. You constantly need to iterate the product and release new versions, especially in software as a service uh, world. Every month we have a new iteration of the product. And since we have unlimited ideas for, for the features, but uh, limited resources, the question is first of selection. Which features should we implement? Then the next question is in which order should we implement those features? What is the most important and should be implemented first? And what is least important and should be implemented in a year or never? Uh, the third question is how to promote those features one implemented. How will users find out about uh, those features? Uh, the simplest thing is just to put a button on a home page but that would end uh, with a home page with 100 buttons, which is not the best user interface. So we can also have some kind of onboarding or we have some, uh, some kind of blog or documentation or manual, or we send an email to all the users. They need to find out about the new feature somehow. Uh, then we have as a step four, when we decided, uh, on selecting the features, which order they go, and how we are going to promote them in our product, goes the magical part, uh, number four, where we uh, give, uh, give uh, the feature description to our technical team. They do the technical magic, implement it, deploy it, and release to happy customers who then adopt the feature, ideally. But the task is not done because a few months after that, we should go and check if the feature actually works as we intended. Did people discover it and are they using it in a way that you wanted uh, that feature to be used? And this is uh, bread and butter of uh, product management. So let's go step by step. Feature selection in most companies comes from a variety of sources. Uh, ideas come from founders who, of course, have a vision what the product should be. Then we have product managers whose job is to think about what to add in the next version of product. Then we have salespeople who are facing customers and customers uh, say they demands or they say we are going to buy your product if you implement this. So they are first line of customer feedback and sometimes customers send long emails uh, requesting some feature or having a complaint how the current feature is not working it should be. Uh, and because we have so many requests, the question is how, how to weight all these inputs? What is more important, the, the stuff suggested by the founder or uh, stuff suggested by an angry customer? Uh, and in reality, uh, what uh, often gets decided depends highly on office politics. Because 
it's very subjective and the one uh, who has more political influence finally wins and that feature is implemented. I don't need to say this is not the optimal way to, to implement stuff. Uh, this is, for example, one sales example. Uh, we had at our company where a customer wants a very unique way to invite candidates to a test. He doesn't want them to leave an email. He wants to create hundreds of unique uh, invite uh, URLs and send them one by one manually on his own. And we are like, okay, what to do this? How, how, how do we approach this problem? And then when we decided on the features that we are going to implement, we need to decide on ordering. And there are many, many different ways uh, companies uh, decide in which order to implement which features. Uh, and people find this section quite interesting and quite funny. So I expanded uh, this list of seven methods uh, with memes uh, and we can all go through it and maybe recognize uh, our uh, current employers or previous companies we work for in this uh, methods and we can mention why they are not the best. So one of the methods, project management method is FIFO. So the oldest tickets uh, go first. So if we created something and now is the turn to do it, we are going to implement it. And we don't change the plan. The plan is fixed. We know from the first to 100 ticket which order we are going to implement it. Of course, this is not the best because information change, we get new data and market changes, our customer demands change. But some companies like to stick it to the plan. Then quite interestingly, sometimes quite opposite gets implemented and that is the policy of new tickets first. And that is because of one bias that we all have as humans. And that is that the stuff we are working on now seems like the stuff with the most priority. So if the customer sends an email today complaining about something today and we talk with that customer, we have a sense that is more urgent than the ticket created uh, six months ago. Although six months ago that ticket was also urgent and now after six months it's even more urgent. But uh, it often happens in the companies that they constantly go and uh, turn out fires. Uh, we are definitely guilty of this one. So CEO's tickets first or boss knows. Whatever the boss says, that's going to be worked on today. Uh, we are guilty of that because I would have some kind of idea for a feature on TestDome. And then I will talk with developers, hey, how much would this be? Do you think we could add this, blah, blah, blah. And then the developers, of course, would think, well, the, the founder is talking about this thing. It seems to be very important. Let me implement this first and stop the work I'm doing right now, which may be, of course, of much higher priority. And of course, uh, uh, my opinion is just one data point. And that other ticket he stopped working on is maybe weighted by 20 or 50 customers. Then there is also another bias, which is completion bias. Especially like if you are feeling lazy and unproductive in the morning, then what you're going to do, you're going to clean your inbox, uh, answer all, all emails, and then uh, fix a few cosmetic uh, bugs, you know, align something on the left, align something on the right, and you finish at uh, five o'clock, and you had a very productive day because you put a check mark to 30 items. What a productive day. But this is not the best, because sometimes some big projects require that you start working on them today and complete working on them for the next few weeks 
and then you will be able to uh, feel the joy of completion of that task. Uh, something which is very common in sales-driven organizations, which sell to large customers very expensive software, is money talks syndrome. So if a big customer comes and says they want this, all development stops and all developers start working on that. And there is no doubt that customer is going to be happy when this is implemented, but that's how you often end up with software product that has a lot of features just for one customer. And a feature is used only by one of thousands of customers. So the recommendation is never implement feature just for one customer. Uh, and then in a developer driven organizations, there's often bias to just let developers choose what to work on. Developers are smart people and you know, what can go wrong? Well, intrinsic motivation of developers is to learn new tech, work with exciting, exciting new languages, on exi exciting new projects. Uh, they are not very motivated to work on legacy code. So it often happens that developers tend to use a shiny new technology uh, library or language and implement that and then after that nobody can maintain that or the whole framework or language becomes deprecated. And finally, quite common strategy is just implement stuff randomly, which I think is the default in most organizations. Uh, we, we, we actually have partial blame for this also. Uh, I, uh, I remember this because one time we were in our platform analyzing what is the biggest correlation with the questions customers choose to use on their tests. And we noticed that the customers preferred questions that have names A, B, C, and D. <laughs> because we sorted questions in alphabetical order. And that is, that is really interesting, but human psychology is like that. Uh, the default ordering you have for all your tasks and tickets will definitely influence in which order they are going to be implemented. So these are all anti-patterns. I hope you didn't recognize uh, yourself and your company too much. Then we have another problem of uh, creating new features, and that is feature bloat. Uh, screenshot here is from the core part of our uh, customer application where uh, customers can see current tests and all candidates who uh, are taking that tests. And as you, as you can see, this, this page is just bloated with stuff. There is upper part, which is a, a test name, and you can edit that, and you have a hamburger menu with all the actions on a test, and then you, can, you have tabs, and then you have groupings of candidates in a search, then you have a passing score, and option to invite new candidate, and you can select those candidates, and then you have another drop-down menu with all the available option. Uh, we try to simplify this page so many times, so many times, but uh, as you get to very mature software, it's very hard to make user interface streamlined. At one point, you will have to decide, well, this feature is important, put a button. This feature is not so important, put it in a hamburger menu. So when, if you put it behind a dropdown on a, or a hamburger menu, then you're going to have a problem with feature discovery. 
how are people going to find that feature? Uh, when we have all that, we know the features, we know the order of features, and we know how will we present those features to our customers. Uh, this, this is connected to the feature discovery. Uh, often I hear, well, we're just going to write a blog post about it. It doesn't work because believe it or not, uh, people have uh, uh, better things to do than read your company blog. Like nobody's going to read it. Uh, and even if they read it, they are going to forget about it. So the, the maxim in user interface design is uh, if you have to explain user interface is not good user interface. After we have all that, we put the feature specification in some project management tool and uh, do a handoff to our technical team, which does the magic of implementing that stuff, deploying, make it scalable, performant, whatever. We are not going to talk about that because this is not a technical talk, uh, but just for, for uh, uh, being complete, what we do is we create tickets in uh, Jira and we have different backlogs. You see that uh, there, is a, <laughs> there is quite a backlog for different uh, initiatives inside a company and then developers need to decide okay we are going to start taking tickets from this backlog from this backlog or from this backlog and after the feature is in production we need to check if the feature is actually working as intended and I have to admit most of the times the answer is no. Either people don't know the feature exists, they don't use it, or they are not satisfied how it works. That's one part of the problem, but it will be easy if you could remove a feature which doesn't perform, but we all have sunken cost fallacy. So once we put 40 hours of working to something, we don't want to destroy it. We want to leave it. Somebody is going to use it. And that is generally true for organizations. Once the feature is added, it's very rarely removed. And that creates products which are very bloated with features. Let me give you an example. Uh, when Microsoft asked its customers 20 years ago which features they would like to see in the next version of Microsoft Word. Customers of Quart poured in zillions of request ideas for the features. And then product managers in Microsoft analyzed those requests and found out that 90 to 95% of those requests are featured features already present in Microsoft Word. And like, how is that possible? Well, that is possible because 20 years ago, this is how Microsoft Word would look like if you enabled all the toolbars. So these are not all the features. There are no dialogues, there are no configuration files, there are no options. There are no macros or anything. This is just toolbars. So 20 years ago, when we enabled all toolbars, you would just have one row to write text. 20 years passed, and Microsoft Office didn't become any simpler. They just kept adding features. And sometimes, if you want a simple product, you just need to uh, have a clean start. And in the case of uh, word editors, you can just go and use uh, Google Docs or Notion or Dropbox paper. And product managers there are very conservative about adding new features because they don't want this thing to happen to their product. They want to keep it simple, easy to use. So these are all problems 
what is, what is the solution? From the stuff I have read online, the biggest difference I found with successful software product companies was that they are very data driven. So, okay, founders have ideas, product managers have ideas, customers have ideas, but they always find some way to make a data driven decision, to get feedback from customer and decide on data. And uh, it's important to get feedback from customers both for new features and for existing features. Because when you have data and you have product planning meeting, you can make much better decisions. Then, after you collect the data, you do a classic uh, cost and benefit analysis that uh, everybody knows. Uh, what I learned uh, while reading uh, stuff online is that frequency versus engagement analysis is also extremely useful. And one important thing to solve this problem is not to be too strict about it. So plans can change at any moment depending on the new data arriving because that's being data driven. Uh, it's also important to, to note that we are talking about the process in the middle. So we are in the planning phase. And planning phase looks both at the past and the future. In the past, we had all the options that you know, we had on a table, but we didn't implement them all. We ended up in a, in a certain current state of the system. And now we have all the data from all the past points and all the future is in front of us. And that future can be anything. We can make our product faster or add new features or change the design. And we need to decide which path we want our product uh, to go. Uh, and one, one way to get uh, immediate feedback from customers that involves very little involvement from customers is to enable customer voting. So customer voting is when you have some system where customers can see options for the next features and they just can click like or star or something, something with minimal involvement. And we implement this in TestDOM. We use very simple software, minimalistic, called uh, User Report. But there are many other uh, software that you can do use for, for voting. And we have two separate boards. One board is voting for the content that we should create, so new tests and new questions. So people say, I need more questions for Android, and then people vote on that. And another board is for voting on new features. And people can also create their own new ideas there. So they, they say, uh, I think we should create this, and that stands on the board, and other customers can vote for it. Uh, important thing is we can also vote for these features internally. And uh, when uh, we have a sales call and some of the customers say we need this feature, the salesperson can go to this voting system and add plus one for that customer who voted. Uh, and it, it works very good. So you can see that uh, top voted uh, features on this uh, customer voting board our screen recording, where customers want, when candidates take the test, that the whole screen is recorded periodically. Uh, and they wanted some kind of live coding platform. And uh, these small marks here, uh, this uh, 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 small uh, sand clock, is indicating that idea is being implemented right now. Uh, these are the ideas that uh, we are considering, and again, idea that is being implemented. 
Another nice thing about this uh, uh, voting system is that you can write in detail what the feature is going to be and then you can have a discussion below that description on why somebody needs that feature, uh, how they are going to use it, because it's not always clear. Usually when users create uh, entries like this, uh, they are very ambiguous. And then you need to ask sub-questions to understand what is actually that they need. Uh, people who are not so involved, they can just vote for the question and uh, for the suggestion. And what is nice about it, once you implement the idea, everybody who voted is going to get an email saying, hey, that uh, thing you voted for is implemented in the new version. And that's it. And that's, that gives incentive to the people to vote for the feature. Uh, but this is just one uh, data input when deciding on features. So for example, this feature got not so many votes, 11 votes in three years. And we found out that you can replace this feature with a, a very simple hack. So re re rejected the feature. So we analyzed all, all the submissions, but we are free to decide if it's a good idea or not a good idea to implement it. Uh, you could say, you know, we, we are going to have direct democracy where we are just going to implement it in a way that our users want, but that can sometimes have very funny consequences. For example, a British government wanted to name a research ship, which was 200 million pounds, and they made the online uh, survey. And the top boat, uh, the boat name was Boaty McBoatface. So that, that's direct democracy in action. So let's say that now we know what features our users want. We can do the cost benefit analysis. So we can ask our developers, hey, we have this description of the feature, how long will it take to implement? And they can say, well, it takes 40 hours to implement. Of course, this is just an estimate. Uh, it can be longer than that, but uh, if uh, uh, our team always uh, makes the same uh, estimates, errors on all the features, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, but uh, let's first explain this, this chart, and then we'll, we'll go to a problem. So uh, the best quadrant, when you put all the features on axis where vertical axis is effort, and uh, the horizontal axis is reward, the best quadrant is here, where we need to put little effort and get high reward. These are delightful features, features that are implemented a few hours and delight everybody. Unfortunately, most of the features are in upper quadrant. They are high reward, but they are also high effort. This is usually features which are part of the standard workflow where your customers spend most of the time when using your software. Uh, then we have administrative task quadrant, which takes a lot of effort, but gives a low reward because it doesn't offer anything special to your software or problem. This is like configuring software, adding users, adding permissions, changing a company name, changing a company logo. You need to have it because all software has it, but nobody's going to buy your software because your user management is so great. Uh, and the worst position, uh, uh, in my opinion, is low effort, low reward 
because it just distracts the entire product team is gimmicks and novelty. Small stuff you add, but they also don't add anything to the customer value. And when estimating where something is on a cost benefit chart, what is surprising is that it's harder to estimate customer benefits than it is for developers to estimate feature cost. Because customer benefit is quite abstract. How would you measure? How would you, you can say like something is going to take 20 hours of implementation. You can convert that to some approximate amount in dollars. But customer benefit is much more uh, uh, fluffy. And unfortunately, number of votes is not a good measure of how beneficial a feature is going to be to your customers. And this is where I recommend, highly recommend reading a, a book, Intercom on uh, Product Management, which uh, explains all of this in more details. And I know that uh, a, a lot of you uh, would say, hey, I don't have time to read books. Uh, uh, I need to order it on Amazon or uh, some other uh, blocker, but really there are no blockers for this book because it's free, you can download it, it's short, uh, and there is an audiobook version, so you can download it and listen to the book in your car. It has a lot of practical value because uh, they are a, a large company with a really good uh, product. So what have I learned by reading uh, Intercom's book? They said that what people estimate is going to happen with the feature is absolutely not the thing that actually happens with the feature. Ideally, we think that every feature we add to the product is going to have a similar adoption to existing features. In practice, you will find that some features are used 100 to 1,000 times more than some other features. Uh, and it's quite fascinating to actually analyze feature usage in practice. And they say that if you have a feature with limited adoption, there are four choices. You can either kill the feature, meaning remove it from the product. You can increase the adoption, get more people to use it. You can increase the frequency, get people to use it more often, or significantly improve it for current users. And to know what to do, with a feature, they suggest creating something called a frequency and engagement chart. Uh, where frequency is, for customers that use the feature, how often they use the feature. And for engagement, is which percentage of customers use the feature at least once. So, in ideal world, this is how the chart would look like. And we can see that this feature marked with uh, red, which is sort by rating, is used by almost all customers, and they use it every day. And we see that this feature marked in green, which is searched by keyword, is used by very few people and uh, they don't use it very often. They use it maybe once a month, that's it. And this chart divides all the features in four quadrants and gives advices what to do with features in each quadrant. So in this quadrant are the features that are the best. They are used by most of the people and they use it often. They are important for workflow. 
but everything else could be improved better. So, you can either decide to increase adoption of the feature, which moves it on a horizontal line, or say, yeah, this feature is not going to be used by everybody, but for people who use it, we want it to use it more than once. So increase the frequency of that feature. So the recommendation is for all the features in this quadrant, get more people to use that feature. Either we have a problem with feature discovery, people don't know uh, about that feature, or that feature currently doesn't work for most of our customers. There is a problem, definitely. For features in this quadrant, it's obvious we don't have a problem with discovery. Most of the people use that feature on, uh, at least once, but they don't continue using it. Why then do they don't use it more than once? Well, you need to discover that. But you need to either make feature better or solve bugs in the feature, something like that. And the feature which are not used by many people and they are used very infrequently are the best candidates for killing the feature. Uh, and uh, you will see later Actually, in most products, most features uh, uh, fall in this quadrant. Because, well, let's be real, in any complex software, you can live without most of the features that get added through the years. Uh, and now, that is how it looks in the book. Let's see how it looks uh, in the practice, because we implement this at TestDome. In reality, uh, this chart should be better viewed on a log scale because I can, as you can see, everything groups in this worse quadrant. And uh, we have a problem that uh, we have too many features to analyze, so a lot of features overlap, but we have uh, an option here just to deselect everything and only this one and then we can see just for that feature yeah add candidate note it's used by some people who use it uh, six to seven times uh, in the uh, uh, analyzed time span but this is used by like 1% of customers. Uh, and let me put all, all features back. So if you wanna see details for a specific feature, you can go through, through a table and see exact numbers for, for each of the features. And you, you can notice some patterns which are typical of uh, software. So, the most used feature is invite candidates because, of course, to become a customer of TestDome, you need to invite candidates. That's, that's where we charge you. Uh, and the most active uh, uh, feature, so most frequently used, in, is invite via a candidate via API. Because people who use that feature, they use API to invite hundreds and hundreds of candidates. But of course, there are almost 0% uh, of people who use API in a total pool of customers. And it's very insightful to see your software laid out in this way, to see where all the features lay. Uh, and what is also interesting is this doesn't help only with existing features because uh, when you create a new feature, you can say, I think this feature is going to be adopted like this other feature. For example, uh, we have some export to some file format. You find PDF export, you find Excel export, 
and you have a bulk part to say, well, I think we should add this export is going to be between the PDF and this other file format. You have some ballpark to place your uh, features in. So you, you, you find a feature on the same page or in similar workflow or, or of similar type, and then you can estimate, okay, engagement for this feature is going to be 20% uh, uh, of customers, and I think they are going to use it uh, with frequency of five. And that enables you to derive the benefit to the customers. So exactly this chart. And to summarize everything uh, we went through, so when creating a product, beware of product management anti-patterns. All the ways that uh, people uh, come with ideas for features and order those features which are maybe intuitive, but not very systematic and uh, bite you in the end. And when you create some system that works for your company and your product, try to use data from multiple sources. You have internal sources like founders, managers, salespeople, but more important are uh, external sources. So you need to uh, 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 have some system to track customer requests. I recommend implementing such system to have customer vote on features. Uh, you can go deep down, especially if you have complex software and do customer interviews. You can also do A-B tests. That's uh, the talk we had uh, two years ago, how to do A-B testing as a small company. And you can measure each feature in your analytic tool and produce a frequency and engagement chart. So the benefit of having that chart for the whole team is that every programmer can go and see, okay, I need to implement this, how important this is and they can deduct from the chart how much effort they should put into that. And uh, tools that uh, we showed here are customer voting system, classic project manager uh, management favorite cost benefit analysis, and a new frequency versus engagement chart. And uh, number one advice from uh, that book, Intercom on Product Management, is don't be afraid to kill features that don't perform. I know it's hard, but uh, it leads to less bloated products. That's all for me.